Okay, just to recap on where we've been so far in this series, what I was really trying to explore was the question, how did we get here? If we really are in terminal decline and collapse for humanity, it's just around the corner, then I assume people are going to be asking soon when they catch up with this reality, they're going to be asking, how did we get here? And I'm composing my version of an answer to what it could have been. And one of the contributors I think that we should highlight is the contribution of the Aryans to the situation where we are today. But let's come back to that. In the last episode, I promised to reveal to you what I thought Soma was, the mysterious ritual plant that was so important to the Aryans that they actually made a god out of it. There's been a lot of speculation about what it could have been. There's been a lot of candidates, everything from opium to cannabis. Uh, but I don't really buy into any of those. If you go back to the clues, you'll remember that there was the staff of uh, Schlepius, there was the staff of Osiris, uh, there was the Caduceus, and then there were the snakes wrapped round the staff, two of them in the case of the Caduceus, uh, one of them in the case of Slepius's staff and the Deus Leontikephalus, which seems to be a personification of Slepius's staff. Then there's also the mysterious pine cone, and the pine cone is important. The pine cones everywhere in the reliefs on the uh, in the Assyrian reliefs. And they also appear in India. There's even a pine cone outside the Vatican. But let's come back to that one. So these are all clues. There was another clue that it was something to do with a lotus or a flowering aquatic plant. And so it seems to be a big clue to what this mysterious soma is, what the tree of life is. And by the way, uh, don't forget that this is also the tree in the Garden of Eden. This is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And uh, so it's kind of a warning against eating from the sacred tree. Um, you know, that's the fall of Adam came, came from that. And again, it was done by the snake. The snake pops up. So uh, these two snakes entwined around the caduceus, the wings on top of the caduceus, um, they all clues to a plant. The pine cones are in stone reliefs in India. And many people have come out and said, oh, they must have been in contact with South America because, you know, here they have corn cobs clearly shown in these reliefs. Well, they're not corn cobs and they're not pine cones. Here's what I think uh, Soma was. It's actually a cobra lily. And here's what a cobra lily looks like. And you'll see why <laughs> I think it's so obviously encoded in all these reliefs. Cobra lily is a carnivorous plant. The reason why it hasn't been identified as soma uh, is because it doesn't fruit very often. But as soon as it fruits, you can see why it is. it looks like a pine cone. It's actually a staff that comes up called the spadix in botany. And then this fruiting body forms on the top, green at first, but then it turns bright red. And the seeds of the cobra lily are actually psychedelic, they're hallucinogens. So some people have come out and scholars have said, well, no, this uh, Persian relief is all about um, really pollinating the tree of life. And so there's a bag of pollen over here. And then, you know, for some reason they're using a pine cone to pollinate the tree of life uh, instead of a feather or a brush or something, which is more like what you'd expect. So it doesn't really hold together. But the cobra lily, uh, the fruit of the cobra lily is a psychedelic drug and they're making a brew out of it. And that's what Soma is. It's not entirely 
in the open uh, it's semi-secret it's sort of encoded so the tree of life doesn't always look like a cobra lily but the cobra symbolism co pops up again and again especially in Egypt now something seems to have gone awry in Egypt maybe they didn't have enough cobra lilies or the cobra lily was so overused that they had to substitute it but in Egypt they start to substitute the cobra lily as far as I can tell um, with the blue water lily so the blue water lily was brewed up especially with wine and to to make a, a brew that also gave you a trip um, it's a psychedelic drug and it was also supremely important in the rituals particularly of rituals of the afterlife so the tree of life is the cobra lily and the uh, blue water lily uh, was the Egyptian version of uh, of that and T Tutankhamun's tomb his sarcophagus was filled with these blue water lilies uh, which shows you the importance of that symbolism especially for uh, getting to the afterlife and that's the whole point of what was going on here so I think the shamans went and meditated in caves and they made the discovery that you could actually produce these trips on your own just through these um, techniques of dhyana meditation now authoritarians and the Aryans were authoritarians came in and substituted a drug as a shortcut saying you know why take all these years to develop these uh, these mystical experiences when we can give you a shortcut to them uh, just with these drugs and then that puts them in control that's the, re the reason they're doing it it means that they are forever intermediaries between you and this new god in the sky this masculine god in the sky that they have and it continues all the way down to the Pope he's the hotline to God that that you have and that's the old authoritarian trick of being uh, the top of the hierarchy and intermediary to the very apex of the hierarchy which is this mythical God in the sky and so it's an old authoritarian trick that is still carried on today and people buy into it because they want a shortcut they don't want all the hard work uh, of the shamans so the shamans become eclipsed and their knowledge uh, gets forced underground uh, like Aldous Huxley said uh, you know they're using Soma to keep the population in, in line they're keeping them uh, docile um, and they're selling them uh, this idea that they have the keys to the afterlife and here's the proof they, have, they you know, can do this magic trick they can do David Copperfield using psychedelic drugs so back in episode 4 part uh, 1 the zoo in your head the psychosis edition um, I was still trolling people back then and I had a little clip a teaser of the cobra lily and I was talking about the uh, shamanic formula and how these fake shamans which are called priests uh, they had their own version of what I was calling eupsychosis uh, that's what the the shamans taught you and how to basically liberate yourself uh, through natural means in that clip then I just mentioned how the uh, really carnivorous plant the cobra lily um, how it eats flies and how it has these false windows I mentioned that you would get trapped if you used uh, some of these psychedelic drugs to achieve some of these mystic states of the shamans psychotropic drugs just allow you to take a quick and temporary peek through the keyhole of the doors of perception it's just a movie of true liberation, a trap. There are false windows on eternity that in the end will trap you like a bug. I must say that I thought back on that clip um, be, where, when uh, the Notre Dame Cathedral uh, burnt this week and everybody was very pleased because the huge bay window um, was left intact and I couldn't help thinking back to the false windows in that plant because eventually the Soma became religion and the uh, 
cross reference between that stained glass window uh, and how the carnivorous plant, the cobra lily, actually traps bugs. I just wondered how many people were captivated by that stained glass window and trapped the same way into this carnivorous religion of Christianity. So just as an aside, about the pine cone outside the Vatican, that one isn't a cobra lily. That one really is a pine cone. So that pine cone is associated with Attis. I've mentioned Sibylle and Attis, her consort, um, a number of times. So Sibylle, as you might remember, is the Earth Mother. Uh, in her form incarnated in Anatolia in Turkey today, uh, then she's called Sibylle. And she moves to Rome, she becomes the official religion of Rome. Uh, the cult of Sibylle uh, and the Sibylian temple is right there in the center of Rome. Uh, you can go and visit it today and guess what it is? Yes, it's the Vatican. Yes, uh, the Pope is actually a Sibylian priest. If you go to the Vatican, you'll see there's hardly a touch of Christianity. It's just a, a token reference that they have to, to Jesus in the Vatican. It's really a pagan cult temple, and it's Sibylle's cult. cult. Uh, the, the Pope himself is a, is a Sibylian priest, and he wears the, the cap of Sibylle. So, yeah, he's not sitting on St. Peter's throne. <laughs> he's sitting on Attis's throne. Um, but anyway, we'll come back to that little detail later. I just wanted to clear that up that, yes, there is sometimes actually a real pine cone. But apart from that, I think uh, what we're looking at is a cobra lily, and that's the secret to what Soma is, and it's a drug for domination. Now, people like Graham Hancock have campaigned long and hard for the legalization of these psychedelic drugs, particularly things like LSD that uh, really expand your mind and free your mind. The idea is uh, keep your laws off my consciousness. Yeah, I'm all in agreement with uh, not having psychedelics be illegal. Um, but I would point out that uh, the shamanic way is the better way. So the shamanic way of producing them yourself, uh, no one can regulate them, no one can take them away from you. Um, and it's interesting though because they start off I think with the shamans uh, sitting in caves and learning through just reflection and meditation deep underground, they start to learn how to um, produce these psychedelic drugs and neurotransmitters in their own brains uh, naturally just by these austerities and practices. Then the authoritarians come in with a shortcut, uh, Soma, and that allows them to consolidate their authority. Um, so. It comes full circle because eventually they don't even need the soma. So I think over time it's possible that they overused soma and it became a rarity. So that's why it was replaced by the blue water lily uh, in Egypt. In some respect it's like some of the early contraceptives that uh, went completely extinct. Uh, there's one particular one in Greece that was driven to extinction by overuse. Um, by people collecting it and using it as a uh, contraceptive. Eventually, the Aryans and authoritarians clamp down on their power so much that they don't even need uh, any of these anentheogens or psychedelic drugs in the rituals. They, can, they get to the point where uh, they can just substitute uh, some token things, like eventually in the Christian church they substitute bread and wine and eventually wafers. And in fact, if you go to the modern churches today, I think most of them have uh, got rid of the wine for the same reason. It was it used to be one of the big selling points. One of the, the reasons why you would actually go to communion was to have the bread and the wine. And it was an easy trick to get in the masses. Um, and But because of uh, you know reasons that some people are alcoholic and um, 
there's a danger about AIDS, they think, and so, yeah, they don't even give you the wine. And the same thing happened with the Aryans. Eventually, they didn't even need to give you the Soma. And eventually, it comes full circle. It becomes a threat. Psychedelic drugs then are rediscovered by people like Ken Kesey in the 1960s. And the authorities jump on them in a huge way and clamp down amazingly quickly because they cannot afford to have alternative states of mind uh, inside this really oppressive hierarchy. So alternative states of mind are a huge threat to a coercive uh, authoritarian. And so uh, eventually the trick becomes the threat again. It's just as Heraclitus says, everything becomes its opposite in the end. So I would say to people like uh, Graham Hancock, you know, forget about what's on the schedule one drug list. Uh, really, the true aim is to manufacture these um, yourself if you want to go in that direction. I mean, there is no gateway to God. These are not giving any, uh, any afterlife. Um, all of that is a trick. It's just fake. There is no God in the sky. Um, there is no eternal life. And I'm sorry to Graham Hancock, but there is no soul <laughs> except uh, an individual soul, let's say. There's no personal soul that can be given eternal life. It's, uh, it's a myth that, that first shamans come up with to cope with uh, thanatophobia, your alien cortex starting to take center stage. And as it takes center stage, it starts to worry and obsess about death, and um, that produces anxiety. The shamans are acting as healers for that anxiety. So religion emerges as part of therapy to cure your alien cortex. It eventually comes full circle again, and it becomes a disease of the brain that is going to make us go extinct. Part of the reason why our civilization will collapse is to do with this authoritarian thinking, this authoritarian uh, mandate that came from religion. Now, you remember I mentioned the Epic of Gilgamesh. He's Noah, and he survives the Great Flood. If you have a look at the Bible about the four sons of Noah and the rainbow, uh, the covenant of the rainbow, that the psychopathic, mythical, mysteriously absent, by the way, uh, God in the sky, um, he, he supposedly in the Bible makes this uh, covenant of the rainbow with Noah, in other words, you know, hey, uh, Scout's honor, I won't uh, annihilate you ever again uh, that way. Maybe some other way, but anyway, not with flood, okay? So we all quits. And uh, then he says this, which makes very interesting reading and starts to show you the mindset that has really doomed us, the mindset that comes from religion. The covenant of the rainbow. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on every living creature on the earth, every bird of the air, every creature that crawls on the ground, and every fish of the sea. They are delivered unto your hand. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you all things. That's a rather unexpected promotion mankind just got, considering that only a month before, supposedly God committed mass genocide on our species as a penalty for behaving like humans, presumably how he himself created us. Now that we've subdued the earth and gone forth and multiplied to the extent of 7.7 .7 billion people, you can easily see how that blueprint for human annihilation in Genesis 6 turned out. Just watch a few BBC Nature documentaries and learn a little about how we stand at the brink of climate catastrophe and the sixth mass extinction. Can disaster be avoided? Well, certainly not while 2.2 billion of the fruit of Noah's loins still believe in Noah and what the Bible says. If you haven't figured out the obvious by now, our alien cortex is Satan, and Satan wrote the Bible. Any neurologist will confirm that for you. So one of the reasons why the Aryans find themselves in opposition to the shamans is not only because they're authoritarians, but it's because there's a strong gender divide. There's a big gender war going on, as far as I can see. The shamans are still believing in the Earth Mother, this universal religion they take for granted 
that uh, the Earth Mother Prima Mater is Sibylle, Ishtar, Isis, Virgin Mary. She's she's the uh, Mother Goddess. It gets superseded for the first time, as far as I can see, by the Aryans. Suddenly it becomes masculine. It's not the Earth anymore. It's become something up in the sky. It later gets associated with the sun. It's in opposition to this uh, female deity. Now, how can we be sure of these kind of things? Well, you can't. You just have to pick up the clues. But I think the evidence makes sense. The picture is, uh, is quite convincing, at least to me. So, one of the ways that we know this kind of stuff is from the linguists. Um, you remember in the last video I said that the linguists can deduce an amazing amount from the language that they could reconstruct of the Aryans. Um, such amazing details, it's quite astounding. Just from the clusters of words and how they used words, uh, they can tell, for example, that the Aryans didn't use the, didn't have references to the bear for ritual reasons. So it was taboo to, to talk of the bear. Now you'll remember, I hope, that the bear and the cow is one of the uh, incarnations, uh, personifications of the Earth Mother Goddess. So I think it's significant that a detail like that uh, shows that they're in opposition to the Mother Goddess. Um, in fact, they in opposition to death. It's, a, it's kind of a hero cult, psychologically speaking. And that's why it's the tree of life. It's, uh, you know, we can defeat nature. We can defeat death. Uh, we'll, we'll win out. And it, it carries on. The same thinking carries on to this day with geoengineering. We're going to geoengineer our way out of this. The, the planet is kind of our enemy. And we will subdue her. And it's, uh, it has overtones of, of rape. But it's a desperate, heroic attempt. Uh, male attempt for survival. The way I would characteristic characterize it is that it's your alien cortex and your reptilian brain. If they're given too much testosterone, uh, they form an unholy alliance. And you can see this alliance, I would go as far as to say, and now I probably lost everybody here, but <laughs> as far as I can tell, uh, if you look at the left wing and the right wing, politically speaking, the uh, right wing is an unholy alliance between uh, the alien cortex and the reptilian brain. They both seem to be on testosterone, uh, and you can see the psychology play out in fascism. On the other side, on the left wing, you have something similar, an unholy alliance between the alien cortex and the mammalian brain, in other words, the Earth Mother. And with that, you get totalitarian communism. So it's, you know, the nanny state and uh, mother knows best, uh, nurse knows best. Um, that oppressive um, overdominance that kind of, uh, I think they captured very well in the movie Misery. Um, you know, that uh, the character in, in, the, uh, in the movie Misery, she personifies this overdominant uh, matriarchal figure who is deadly in the end. Shh, darling. Trust me. God's sake. It's for the best. Hey, please! She, her ultimate aim is to kill you. So you can see her pop up again. A, a great manifestation of her is Kali in India. And I must come back to Kali um, just as much as I'd like to get on to Sibylle. Uh, Kali really gives the essence of it because Kali is the older religion in India it's the shamanic religion it still survives to this day and you can see a lot about what the shamanic religion was about the amazing thing is the earth mother isn't all sweetness and light and oxytocin and cuddly uh, she gives you birth she nurtures you she does this kind of English patient thing in the end where she kills you out of mercy so she makes love to you, um, she sustains you, and then she kills you from the point of view, at least from the alien cortex and the masculine side of our persona, what Jung would call the animus. 
And uh, the same applies in, in different uh, respects to the anima, but this is essentially a male problem. The alien cortex is dominated by, by testosterone and the forward-looking uh, thanatophobia, the fear of death that has caused us so much trouble, in some sense you could say that's the cause, the primary cause, uh, exhibit one for why we're going extinct is um, our fear of death. Huge irony, but the alien cortex is filled with irony. Now, going back to the, uh, the Aryan's language and what we could tell from it, uh, you can see not only that they're doing ritual slaughter for, of uh, horses and cattle, which is significant, uh, because then it's a ritual uh, slaughter of the Earth Mother, showing dominance again over the Earth Mother. But it carries on, as I mentioned, these things carry on in the, the Mithraic cults, in the mysteries, in, in, uh, even in Rosicristianism, in, even uh, in Masonry, Freemasonry, you can see these things carry on um, almost in secret. Even in the Mithraic cults, you can see the Torobaleum, where they're doing uh, sacrifice of the bull and bathing in the bull's blood. It's a rejuvenation uh, cult. It's uh, part of the rites to gain immortality, and that, after all, is what the alien cortex wants. It's engineered the whole planet into destruction by trying to achieve its limited um, immortality. So, you can see this, uh, the linguists can see this in the Aryan language. I can't help but see it as militaristic. Um, and part of the reason why I blame the Aryans for where we've got to is because in the very structure of their language and the language we inherited is a way of thinking, is a way of thinking militar militaristically, it's a way of thinking um, with dominance, it's a way of thinking uh, masculine and, and patriarchal uh, framework of viewing the entire world that we still are burdened with um, today. In fact, maybe more than ever, even with the gender wars and postmodernist feminism, uh, there hasn't been a dent in this very idea of uh, the masculine way of thinking, and we inherited it from the Aryans. Now, George Orwell had great insight into this because language itself and grammar dictates the way that you think and so he had if you remember in 1984 they deliberately tweaked with the english language to make uh, newspeak and newspeak uh, was cunningly crafted so that you couldn't even commit thought crime thought, thought crime of course is being any crime against the state and authoritarianism so by just tweaking the language they could edit out words and construct a grammar so it would be impossible to um, think of any kind of rebellion or any kind of uh, anti-authoritarian thought uh, they could actually work it out of the system and i think that that was a great insight on the part of George Orwell because it's almost proven by linguists. For example, in the Aryan language, uh, just the grammar means that when you form a sentence around a verb, uh, you have to, for example, say what tense it is, past, present, present or future, and you have to say how many actors were involved. Um, now that sounds to me pretty much like a report coming back from a military scout uh, reconnoitering uh, the battlefield ahead. Uh, it seems to have that kind of connotation. There are also connotations of inbuilt uh, slavery. Um, now compare that to, to, for example, say the, the Hopi language. In the Hopi language, uh, you don't have to say what tense it is, but you are required uh, to say where the source of the information was and how credible it was. So you have to say whether you were an eyewitness or what you're saying is hearsay or it's just some universal truth uh, that anybody can verify for themselves. Now that's a crucially important thing. It might seem insignificant to you, but to see how important it is, uh, if you go back to the one of the videos I had previously, I think it might have been the part two of the second version, uh, episode two, part two, I think, about freedom, 
I mentioned uh, Daniel Everett um, with the Piroha people. So he was a Christian missionary. He went to South America to live with the Piroha people uh, for a long period, for decades, on and off. And he was the first pe person to translate their language. He never, tra he never converted them to Christianity. That was the whole point of uh, really deciphering their language was so that he could write, rewrite the Bible um, in their language and convert them uh, to Jesus. In the end, if you recall that early video, the exact opposite happened. Daniel Everett was converted to their atheism. Now, one of the reasons why he had a lot of trouble converting them is because of their grammar. Their grammar actually protected them from this disease of the brain called Christianity. And the reason was that whenever he tried to do what uh, Christian evangelists call witnessing, it's basically a, a cunning, devious trick where you lay your heart out on the line and try to tell people about your experience with Christianity and try and you know, pull on their heartstrings to suck them in. Highly manipulative, very alien cortex uh, use of, um, of really the manipulation, I would say, of your mammalian brain, but let's not go into that. Uh, so, yeah, this highly manipulative witnessing, they were, the Piraha people were entirely inoculated against it, just because of their grammar. They asked him, Daniel Everett, that is, they said, okay, this Jesus character, uh, you met him? And of course he had to say no, and they said, oh, so this is all hearsay. And he said, yeah, well, it's the word of God in the Bible. And they went like, oh, so, you know, you've never met him. It's not even hearsay. It's just some rumor out there. And he had no real reply to that because it was, it was just really a myth. Uh, their very grammar didn't allow these kind of myths like Christianity in. And eventually the Piraha said, look, stop talking about Jesus. We don't want to hear any more about Jesus because to them, it's just a kind of a lie. It's unverified truth. Uh, it's unempirical. Um, so therefore, you know, don't waste our time with, uh, with this. We like you, uh, Daniel, but please stop with your lies about Jesus because we want to hear stuff that you know, that you saw, that we can trust you, or otherwise stuff that we can verify for ourselves. But other than, other than that, uh, stop with this Jesus. And so Everett had to stop his evangelizing. And now think of the opposite. The opposite is also true. You can build into the language uh, the very fact that there's a deity in the sky, that there's a hierarchy, that you military, militarism, dominance, and slavery, ownership of everything, including the earth and other people, is built into our language, and then it seeps into our law, and eventually it starts to uh, get into our politics, our culture, and eventually starts to destroy our planet. And I think that's the story, at least one of the threads, that determines why we've come so unstuck today. So Proto-Indo-Europeans, Aryans, just by their very language, gave two-thirds of Europe a, an outlook, a patriarchal viewpoint, an idea of dominance and militarism. And that's the reason... I think why Europe eventually colonized most of the world. Now, if you ask Jared Diamond, then if you read Guns, Germs and Steel, then he has all sorts of politically correct geographical reasons, this kind of, uh, you know, seeds in the sower kind of uh, parables on how people became what they were and some had more goods than others because they sprouted up on stony ground in this area and on fertile ground in this area. And he really, Jared Diamond, has looked over the planet and clearly tried to come up with a post politically correct and neutral answer to this question that his friend Yali in uh, Papua New Guinea asked him. Why you white men have so much cargo, and we New Guineans have so little? They're among the most culturally diverse and adaptable people in the world. 
So why are they so much poorer than modern Americans? And Jared Diamond spends many years trying to answer this. The reason why he struggles so much is because he has to completely dismiss any racial or ethno-nationalist uh, answers, which are the easy answers if you'd asked any uh, anybody in the 19th century that'd say, well, we're from the Aryans and we're superior. Um, so uh, that would have been the answer why white people dominate the earth. Uh, but Jared Diamond jumped through hoops and eventually came out with this idea that latitude had something to do with it and then there were more um, more animals to domesticate. It's uh, completely horseshit. But what really happened was the mere domestication of animals. Uh, if you go back to Gobekli Tepe and that video was uh, animals were domesticated to really fulfill these rights to uh, support festivals. Um, they the the big draw, they become the big cities. Um, and the cities are ultimately the thing that's the fast breeder reactor for our alien cortex and the thing that actually dooms us. So Jared Diamond had this almost cult-like following uh, because he came up with this politically correct answer to a very politically sensitive question and because places of learning were becoming more diversified uh, over time, then uh, really uh, colleges really and uh, pedagogues really liked this answer. It became popular because it was an easy sell to a multicultural audience and it didn't inc include any kind of uh, ethno-nationalist or racist um, answers to uh, Yali's question. So. Uh, yes, if you see some of these acolytes that write papers in the wake of, of what he said, then uh, they have this phrase that people are the same the world over. So he starts from that premise, and I read some papers where I think that phrase was repeated maybe 12, 12 times uh, in a thousand words that phrase was used. So it's the kind of mantra they use, and clearly not everybody's the same. Not everybody has this uh, alien cortex that has run away with itself as it, it did with white people, Caucasians, let's be honest, they, they're just white males. Um, so yeah, it is a politically incorrect answer, but uh, I think it's time we face facts. It's, um, it's, it's time to tell the truth. It's time for truth and reconciliation. And one of the truths is to just fess up and own up to these things like, yeah, Caucasians and their religion and their language uh, put us in a spot. Um, and I'm saying that from being one of them. I, uh, this is my heritage I'm talking about. So not all races, ethnicities and nationalities are equally to blame. Uh, the Europeans and uh, the Aryans, uh, the Aryan forebears are really responsible. If you don't believe me, then just have a look at some of the graphs. If you have a look at, say, this graph over here of uh, the CO2 emissions and have a look at the regions, all of these are descendants of the Aryans. They essentially are Indo-European speakers. Although it's not politically correct, it's unfair to pussyfoot around the naked truth that CO2 emissions since the start of the Industrial Revolution have been mainly from the United Kingdom, the EU, and the United States. China and India barely feature, and as to Africa and the rest of the world, they don't even make a dent. Indo-European culture and Indo-European speakers, I think we must single out and say that it by far is the reason why we're going extinct. Uh, it's the reason that created this culture and uh, the religion of extinction. Uh, we've lived it and now we're going to die from it. Okay, in the next episode, I think we should go back to the shamans and one of their big discoveries that I think they stumbled upon. And that was the way of achieving what I would have called in the previous videos, uh, eupsychosis. I think they would have called it, at least in the Hindu tradition, Maha Samadhi. How to achieve that by natural means, the way you can also achieve it by taking uh, psychedelics as a shortcut.
but only as a temporary shortcut and ultimately a trap. Um, but if you do it autonomously, uh, as a shaman would have taught you, I think uh, I will give you the key to what they were doing and what they must have stumbled upon that allowed them to unlock, uh, particularly, say, the DMT in their pineal glands and give themselves uh, more than a natural high. Uh, Maha Samadhi could be a high that you never came down from. So, yeah, you could go into Samadhi, uh, go catatonic and die from it. And that was considered basically being released from life into, uh, released from rebirth, in fact, into an everlasting life. But I think that uh, it's worth going to Egypt and to pick up in Egypt. Uh, and I also promised you about the Asanas. And I think they, uh, that's the postures. And I think they're exemplified best in Egypt. So let's pick up the story with the Osiris staff and the Osiris myth and his battle with Set, which I would equate to your alien cortex.